Are we ready for episode three? I'm ready. Greg, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, welcome to the Alfie Podcast. This is episode three. We have a very special guest. Of course, we have my brother, Johnny Alfie, here in the studio, and a friend and our guest today, Greg Dinkin. So Greg, I'm going to introduce you briefly as a man of many talents and traits. He's a author, a best-selling author. You have how many? Five best-selling books? Uh, well, I've written six total, not all bestsellers, but <laughs> okay. we'll go with it. Good. They were excellent books. I've read three of the six, and we'll get into some of that. You're also a health enthusiast, a certified health coach, a business coach or consultant, mm -hmm. um, a keynote speaker, singer-songwriter, <laughs> a lot of talents. They so. pay me to speak. They pay me not to sing. <laughs> and he's a poker champion. And, of course, how did I miss that? He's a, I forget that. He's a poker champion. World Series of Poker. You've been at the table. You've been at the finals. Yep. Um, so very cool. And we're going to touch all these things because they, they all interrelate somehow. Of course, this podcast is about health and growth and being the best version of yourself. And you as a healthy enthusiast, I know we've had a lot of conversations um, about this subject. Um, of course, you know we do airway we do jaw surgery, make people breathe better. And you spent a day with us doing consultations and you spent today in the operating room seeing our double jaw surgery. Um, I just wanna, before we get into all of it, um, talk about uh, your newfound perspective and uh, we'll go backwards and how you find that it relates to Well, I'm, I'm, I'm continued to be blown away. It, it's. I think it's interesting how this is such an undiagnosed problem, right? And people are attacking it through different ways. But like, you know, to, to, to now understand that it really is the airways. And, and I mentioned to you, I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in 2009. Mm -hmm. And Sally Fallon, who runs the Weston Price Foundation, she came and spoke to us. So it's been 15 years that I knew that that oral health and, and that our jaws were getting smaller. I heard that 15 years ago. And then I lived at a holistic health retreat in Thailand and met people that I, one guy had 22 amalgam fillings and in right. his words was going insane and worked with Hal Huggins, who was like the, the OG of, um, of holistic dentistry to get him taken out. So this was all very, I, I, I knew it. I knew that there was a tie in. And then my godson, who's in his twenties, he's thin, he doesn't snore got diagnosed with sleep apnea. And that's when I was like, I, I really thought he was misdiagnosed. I was like, you don't snore, how, how can you right. have it? And so this is all really just very eye-opening. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because that's one of the biggest misconceptions, not only in the public, but also even in medical school and dental school, I went, went to both. And we think about sleep apnea as people, you know, they're gonna be obese, they snore, they're sedentary, they're usually older males. Um, but as we see in this practice, that's that's only a very few, that's a small subset of sleep apnea patients. Um, yeah, a lot of fit young people. A lot of fit young people have sleep apnea. And what we actually learn is that probably everybody has sleep apnea <laughs> until proven otherwise or, or with few exceptions. And uh, those who follow us know uh, our, t our take on the decrease in jaw size over the year and what it does to our population. And how that affects sleeping for everybody. Um, so yeah, to your point, for your godson, uh, that's something that we encounter every day. And uh, I think you've seen some of those patients. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, people of all ages and all different um, past problems that they've had that really brought them to you. You know, and also I've, I've been wearing this aura ring for five years. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I've studied Matthew Walker. I read Why We Sleep. I have good sleep hygiene. I take my magnesium. I sleep in a cold room. I sleep in a dark room. And I'm not a good sleeper. Right. And so when you had said to me that I'm a candidate, um, my original thought was, well, I, I know I, I, well, I don't really think I have apnea based on I'm not waking up a ton. But the more I think about it, like I've tried everything else. 
Mm-hmm. So it, it, I, opening up my airway is only going to help me. And the fact that it's a one hour surgery, it's a fairly easy recovery. Look, I'm a poker player, risk return. Right. You know, and so I think when most people hear surgery, but now that I'm, what I've seen it myself, it's like, wow, the return is astronomical. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to sleep better. I'm going to live better. Right. I mean, when I don't sleep as well, you know, when I don't have a good night's sleep, you know, e- everything is off. As yep. we know, cognitively, crave sugar, all those things. So if I could one hour and a one week pretty easy recovery, yeah, like I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The poker take on that is interesting because it's true. Everything in life is risk return, especially surgery. And for a long time, even when I started my career, uh, jaw surgery was something that I would talk people out of. Um, because it was a long operation, four, six, eight hours, and the recovery was difficult. People were wired shut, banded, but you're right. That's not true anymore. You saw the surgeries today. Um, uh, today they went just shy over an hour, and uh, the recoveries, as you'll see tomorrow, are, are nothing like what we have known jaw surgery to be. They're, they're much better. And, yeah, the rewards, uh, obviously there's risk and there's recovery, but the rewards are, are tremendous, and it's it's a lot of fun being on this side of it and, and seeing patients go through it. Let's go back to poker. Um, because okay. I, I, w- I was reading on the plane yesterday the Poker NBA. Uh, excellent book. It actually inspired me. I want to play poker now. <laughs> Sounds like a really fun game. Did he give you false confidence? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, he says doctors are not good poker players, and, yeah. and it's stated <laughs> in the book. <laughs> Well, I mean, what we talked about that, look, it's poker is, you know, what, what do I do with a pair of aces? It depends. What, what depends on what? Well, it depends on 47 variables, right? Like, right. what's your position? What's, what's your table image? You know, uh, what's your opponent's chip stack? There's so many things. And I think in, in science in general, mm-hmm. there is an answer. Right. When you do calculus, there, there's no it depends. Right. The answer is this. And so... You know, the, the notion of um, being open minded and it depends. I mean, we talked about your training. There was no right. it depends. There right. was this is how you do it. Right. And so, you know, I applaud you for like continuing to ask, like, why? Why do yes. we have to do it that way? Curiosity. Can we challenge it? Is there a better way to do it? And yeah. so that that mentality of just not, not accepting the status quo. Right. Have yeah. You played with a lot of doctors. I play with a fair amount, and and for the most part, they're 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 bad. I mm-hmm. think part of it is because the, the the doctors that come to the poker player are often coming after work, and they're just trying to uh, escape. Right. But I also I found that they're not really good thinkers. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, they're they're for the most part a lot of rule followers. Um, you're right. Maybe the it depends personality is is not so common. For doctors, I find myself to be an it depends guy. I remember when, when we had that conversation at dinner. Yeah. Or, you know, is it a always and never or it depends? And I, I think I subscribe to the it depends. And maybe that's why um, I enjoy and admire the mamba mentality so much about trying to grow and question. And uh, I think that's that's why we're here. And we've we've been able to develop a surgery that's faster. So I think it's a good and bad thing that doctors are rule followers that can go both ways um, because of the risk of surgery and how they treat people. It's probably good that they're good at following rules um, overall. But it's also important to question why we're doing the things that we're doing. Yeah, I, I think there should be a little bit of both. Um, definitely have to follow rules, make sure you're within standards. Um, but at the same time, and I, I like to tell residents, is keep an open mind. St- think outside the box a little bit and always question what you're learning. Because in surgery, you know, the motto is see one, do one, teach one. And it's it's kind of true. Like in, in training, that's that's the way it was. It was you see it, you do it, you teach it. And what happens is if everybody sees, does, and teach over time, everyone's doing the same thing and 40 years have gone by. So I, th- I, th- I do think as technology improves and knowledge improves and we know so much more every year, it's important to start asking questions. And I wonder if, from a cultural point of view, you know, is it, are you supposed to challenge the people, the hierarchy, we talked about this, 
you know, the people above you, do they want to be challenged? Do they want you to ask questions? Do they want you to ask why? Do they want you to suggest what if? Right. You know, and the same thing in a business, right? There are some CEOs mm -hmm. that really welcome that. Yeah. You know, the Ray Dalio radical transparency. And there's others where it really isn't. You know, what we're doing works. Just, right. you know, shut up and dribble, you know, do your, do your thing and, and just... So I, I think from a cultural point of view, likely it, in the medical field, it, it's better just to follow. That's where the incentives are. Right. Yeah. That's interesting that you bring up business. I know that's your world too. Yeah, but that's how Blockbuster, Circuit City, all these Sears, all these companies fell, isn't it? But yeah, by, by not adapting. By yeah. not adapting. Yeah. Blackberry, Blackberry. Yeah, 100%. Was resistant to the smartphone. Well, yeah, interface. People love buttons, right? <laughs> people love buttons <laughs> until right? they didn't. They, they, until they didn't. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's it's interesting. I, that's why I enjoy reading business books and and things sometimes that are outside of medicine because everything is interrelated and there's a lot of lessons to learn, like from poker to business and from business to surgery, even. Yeah, and even one one of my favorite business books, "Never Split the Difference" by Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. I mean, really, negotiation is continuing to ask questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the reason he says does, don't split the difference is because that's just lazy. Mm -hmm. You're charging a thousand. I want to pay five hundred. Let's split. Let's make it seven fifty. Right. His point is, if you keep asking questions, you keep looking for things. Yep. That you're going to get to a better solution. Yeah. And if he's challenging you to keep going and really try to solve the other person's problem, or really like actually get on the same side of the table yes. and solve the problem. Yeah. It just it requires continuing to be curious. Yeah, that was a great book. I think that's a must read for everybody. Yeah. And you can tell, like I read that book and I looked back at negotiations that I had and I was, <laughs> I, can, I can think like, man, I think that person read that book. I definitely didn't read that book. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> The mirror, the, the mirroring is an interesting concept. It's a great concept. Yeah, because um, that's that's something that that just you just make people more comfortable. Right. Yeah. Is that matching someone's energy or their vocabulary or a little bit of everything? So it'd be like if you're selling to a New Yorker who's moving really fast, mm -hmm. you're just going to speak faster. Yeah. You know. So it's it's right. It could be the way they sit. It could be the way they speak. But yeah, just generally doing things to make people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you can go too far and get creepy. Right. You know, like someone crosses their legs, you cross their legs. Yeah. But, you know, naturally when a couple is vibing, they're doing this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah. you're just making people feel more comfortable. Yeah. He, he specifically does it by just saying, say the last three words they said. Because mm -hmm. it just shows you're listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what was that? Never pro I'll never propose a deal that I wouldn't want myself or I wouldn't take myself. Yeah, I mean, well, that's just, it's like tactical empathy. Like, he really, right. he's after, like, let's find something that works. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. a good rule. Yeah. You propose well, jaw surgery all the time. Would you get jaw surgery? I, I would definitely get jaw surgery. There you go. Definitely. And your aura One scores, are, they're, they're, they're already <laughs> off the charts. My aura scores are pretty good. David, <laughs> David, yeah, David flexed on Instagram with his aura <laughs> score. I had, a, I had a 98 sleep uh, two days ago, and I had 91 last night. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, very, very proud of that. So, and that, that's a good point about jaw surgery, because I think that I can benefit from a stronger airway despite these good scores and on my aura ring. And the fact that I feel great, you know, we had three double jaws today. Um, we worked out. We're here filming a podcast, and we'll go to dinner later tonight, and I don't feel tired. I feel great. I think that in, in the world of biohacking, that there's always room for better or improvement. And I think one of the, we talked about this, one of the issues with medicine in general is it's very binary. It's sick or not sick. And we're not really taught to look at it on a spectrum of health. But I think that there's a lot to be said about trying to make everybody healthier than they are really that mamba mentality you can always be better right so yeah i, th I think there's room for me to come forward and uh, it's in the, and it's in the and it's not really my world but i gotta think in the 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 marathoners the triathletes uh, there's probably a lot of benefit for them as well or Definitely. any athlete any really. athlete for sure yeah and you could see it you look at the olympics that just passed and you look at the sprinters they have amazing jaws 
and they can run and they can sprint with their lips closed, their lips sealed, and nasal breathe while hauling. Very few exceptions to pro athletes that have that are retrognathic. Mm-hmm. Or that aren't, I mean. Yeah, um, like Lionel Messi. Yeah, very few. And h- even his upper airway is pretty good. Like he has cheekbones. He just has a small mandible, Small, right? lower jaw. But imagine, could he be even better? Yeah. <laughs> He's a candidate? Definitely a candidate. Yeah. Messi, if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> you're a welcome guest over here. I'm not going to ask you what's your favorite book, but of the six that you've written, what's your favorite? Hmm. They, they really all were different. I, I think the Poker MBA was the easiest book for me to write mm-hmm. because, like, that was just, you know, taking everything. I, I always spoke in poker speak about, you know, reading people. Strong is weak. Weak is strong. Yep. So th- that was, in some ways, the easiest book to write. I, I would say The Leading Man was my most personal, bo- personal book because mm-hmm. that, that was, you know, me going to Thailand and me studying... Coney Robbins, all my personal development, and trying to really, one, present it in a way that people would get, Mm -hmm. and then also come up with a methodology. So, you know, guys are like, you know, like, what do I do? So it's like, yeah, I want to get better. I want to work on personal development, but I need some sort of structure. So the challenge of saying, okay, this is where I start. And really, it's it's really seven. Each chapter is questions. So you got to do the work. But that, that was a real... That was a difficult b- book to write, and I think re- rewarding in the sense that I was able to give people a framework to work on themselves. Nice. And then you you give a lot of uh, keynote speeches to businesses, mm-hmm. and I heard you say that uh, as part of some of these speaking engagements, you'll run a poker tournament. Yeah, I mean, like like the just taking these. I'll give you an example. So. In, in poker, we say, like, strong is weak and weak is strong. Mm. So the person staring you down, right? you get that. Like, we just, bullies, you know, are insecure. They're overcompensating. So if they're staring you down, they want you out of the pot. Whereas they're not looking at you, they want you in. And so a friend of mine had a, had a big business in L.A. in 2020. You know, March, April happens. He's supposed to sign a five-year lease for all the square feet. You know, big dollars. And the broker was really pressuring him, like, "Hey, you got to sign this lease. I've got other people that want it. If you mm-hmm. don't sign my close of business tomorrow, you're going to lose it." And thankfully, like he remembered, he went strong as weak. And so that idea of like understanding that concept allowed him to make a really good decision, right? And so that's something I share. The, the poker analogies are interesting. I think what I'm even more interested in now is talking about mind shift. So, you know, a story I, I tell a lot that maybe some people have heard is, is the four minute mile. Mm-hmm. So it was just, it was just a known fact. It was just, it was believed it was in the, the collective consciousness right. that it couldn't be done. And then in 1954, Roger Bannister does it 46 days later, someone else, a hundred days later, three people in the same race. And so, and then I think what gets really interesting and Patrick Bet David, who I worked with, let's just say you have your top salesperson, and the, the best month they've ever had is eighty two thousand dollars in revenue or sales. If he knows that if he can get one person to get to a hundred, everything's going to change. Right. That that that's like because look, we can talk about the banister effect in theory, but what's exciting for me is like to tie it back to something that's really useful. So so what Patrick might do is like. Pick a busy month, have some have some contests, have some incentives, mm. maybe, you know, and just do what anything he can to get one guy to a hundred. Because once you get one salesperson to a hundred, now it changes. Now everyone believes it can be done. Yeah. And, and you have this collective mind shift. Yeah. You know, and, and you and I were talking earlier about um, you know, do our thought is it our thoughts or our actions that right. create change? I wanted to bring that up. Oh yeah, so you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so this notion of, um, you know, if I want to change, you know, if if I want, do I meditate or do I, is it action or thoughts? Right. And it's, it's a real interesting interplay because if you believe you can win. Right. Or in your case with your patients, if you believe you can heal. Correct. 
Some people go, that's very woo. That's very out there. That's but maybe, mm-hmm. but the mind is incredibly powerful and the mind then drives the actions. So you're more inclined to do your exercises. Right. You know, if Dr. Alfie tells me I'm going to heal, if I don't chew, I'm going to listen to him. And those people have better outcomes. Right. I think that's really interesting because something I speak about often is how powerful mindset is. And, you know, being a surgeon for 13 years and, and practice myself, and obviously if you add residency years, it is obvious. There's an obvious difference between patients that have an optimistic glass half full mindset versus the negative patients looking for issues, uh, worried about complications. There's a clear physiological difference in the way they recover. The optimistic patients with the positive mindset cruise through recovery, heal faster, have better outcomes. And it's, it's obvious it's palpable. And, you know, it was so interesting. I went to research and we looked up there, there are re- scientific studies that perform these studies and trying to induce optimistic outlook versus a negative outlook and seeing physiological differences and they're real. But I've seen it firsthand. So what's interesting is, you know, I read that in your book and I, I think I heard you speak about this in the TED Talk years ago, the, the mindset versus it's uh, thoughts or actions. Yeah. And for up until now, really speaking about it i always thought it was the mindset itself but i think you're absolutely right that there so there's a lot of interplay between the mindset and the actions so that the patients that have that positive outlook it's true i look back at it and they are the ones getting out of the bed faster walking the halls faster getting out of the hospital drinking being compliant and it is those actions that help them recover better that's probably where the real physiological changes are so i think that's a really interesting thing yeah and one of the things that that i i took a course called mind power with john kehoe and like a lot of times when something bad happens to people they go oh murphy's law or you know that, uh, mm-hmm. if it wasn't for bad luck i'd have no luck at all and they're saying it and they're mm-hmm. just talking about it almost like see murphy's law if i'm anything small happens like someone pulls out and i get a good parking spot that's just my luck right you know like every little thing that good happens, I'm going, that's just my luck. And right. I seem to keep getting luckier. Yeah. Um, yeah. You manifest it. And, and that, we have to be really careful what we say to ourselves. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Very careful what yeah. we say. Yeah. I think and, one thing I like, Bruce Lee is famous for saying, never speak ill of your own body. Yeah. And, and for people that, that want even want a deeper dive on, on the ability of healing and mindset, Joe Dispenza is a great resource. Mm-hmm. Yes. Spontaneous healing. And what Dispenza does is he takes a lot of this stuff that's very woo, right? And he gives you the science behind it. And I I did his workshop. I mean, he he's he's actually you know um, doing brain scans of people after they meditate. So what's interesting is what the mystics and the yogis and the hippies and the Buddha was saying hundreds and thousands of years ago. Science is now proving this to be true. Yeah. And I think Dispenza is a great bridge. And and you just see it. Like anecdotally, you see it. I see it clear as day, and and vi- you know, and victims, uh, victims are looking for things to go wrong, right? So, and again, they're then c- co-creating that as well, like correct, because if they, they can, they, f- there's a lot of reasons people want to continue to be a victim, but then they, they do things to have That's bad outcomes, true. yeah, yeah, th- that is interesting, and I bet there's a poker analogy to this, and I'll, I'll see if, I'll see if you can find one, but I think that. You know, people say you get lucky or, or they believe people get lucky. And my answer to that is that we all have amazing opportunities presented all the time. And the fact is we probably don't see most of them. But the lucky people, I think, open the doors and just see them more often than the unlucky people. And I think you got to be positive to see those opportunities. Yeah, you know, it's like the, the, the two ones you hear are, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get, or, or luck is when skill meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, and just, yeah, I mean, if you believe good things that happen, you look for them, th- they can happen. Right. What would the poker analogy to that be? I'm sure you have one. Well, in, in, in poker, it, it's just, I mean, the people that, 
I mean, you hear people say, like, I've had aces cracked four times in a row. Mm-hmm. Like, they're just constantly talking. There's the thing in poker, if you, if you have a bad beat, mm-hmm. you know, and someone wants to tell you a bad beat story, they got to give you a dollar. Because it's like, that's what losers do. Right. Like, they just they want to tell you their bad beats. And you, you won't believe what happened to me. You won't believe this, my bad luck. And I had, you know, I had... Uh, I had a full house and this guy had a one out. I think talking about, you know, th- these bad outcomes create more bad outcomes. That's interesting. So you see it in poker, too. Yeah, it's just it's like, it's, why do you want to go around talking about your yeah, bad hands? That's interesting. Yeah. So do the better poker players, meaning the ones that are more successful, are they generally more do they sound more optimistic? They do. And, and even to take it another level, so David Sklansky, I mean, I was reading his book 30 years ago, you know, Texas Hold'em for Advanced Players. So in poker, unlike golf or tennis or, ch- or chess, mm-hmm. the bad players win. Right. So the bad players might win 30% of the time. And the, what Sklansky says is it's a concession to the fish, meaning like you should be happy when these people are beating you because if they didn't beat you, they'd never come back. Mm. And so it's it's mindset, right? Like right. I I lost today. I'm glad that guy won because if he didn't have any chance, I'm, I'm not I'm not challenging uh, Jordan Spieth to a golf match. I'm mm-hmm. gonna lose every time. And so it, it, even that mindset of like, yeah, I lost today. Right. If they didn't, if they never won, they wouldn't come back. Right. Or I understand fluctuation. I understand right. that. Um, if I can get, if I continue to make good decisions, I'm going to win in the long term. Yes, because it really is like all poker players lose. Right. It's it's how you deal with the losing because you lose a few in a row. Right. Just like you know, a baseball player goes into a slump. I mean, Stephen Curry can miss 12 shots in a row. Mm-hmm. He believes he's making the next one. So you know, a lot of it is the the mindset of when I'm losing, how do I? I just view it as variance. Right. I view it as variance, and I view it as yeah, I'm glad that guy won because he's going to keep playing. Yeah, that's a. I think that's a huge takeaway for business, because something that you say in in poker is that not every bad outcome equals a bad decision. Yeah, I can only look back at the hand. Right. I always want to look back at the hand. I mean, just like just you want you want to do a debrief or you want to look back on the surgery. You know, I want to look back on the hand and think, okay, given what I knew then, mm-hmm. how was my decision? Right. Maybe given what I know now, would I make a different decision? But look, you get in situations. People think like poker, oh, I get a royal flush and I go all in. It doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. You're getting in situations where you're a 70% favorite or a 60% favorite, you know, an 80% favorite. You're going to lose a lot of those. So something you'll, you'll hear poker players say is, I got it in good. Mm. Like as long as you get your money in good, when the odds are in your favor, right. you're still going to lose some of them. Mm-hmm. When you look back on the hand and say, if I got it in good, if I played the hand as well as I could, right. and that that's really, I think, the metaphor of poker to business, poker to life. Right. You control your decisions. Mm-hmm. There's skill, certainly long-term, and there's a lot of short-term luck, 